my name's Sam McElnay and I had a serious car accident on the 12th of December 2016. My fitness levels would have been very good before the accident. I was always busy. I'd, I went to tack two days a week, worked three days and milked cows four, and four days a week. Exercise has helped me because when I was in hospital I suffered from pneumonia and exercise strengthened my lungs up and got my breathing back to normal so it did. From I've got out of hospital I've done quite a lot of fix, physical activity as both grandparents as farmers and I've always hung to on them or else I've, I'm busy with work and school work as well. I feel as though my progression in fitness has come on a whole lot from when I've started from when I started my physio with Catherine once I got out of hospital. My life now is very different from my life before the accident because I've been taking everything at a slower pace and enjoying my time more so than going out and working all the time. And I've got myself a girlfriend, so spending time with her is key. The physical activity I do at the moment, you could still find me on the farm or else I'm at work three days a week on in tack two days a week studying an electrical apprenticeship. Well, since the accident, I have now joined the gym and go to the gym at least two times a week on I take part in a spin class. From I got out of hospital, I wasn't really fit to do much, but now my, now my fitness levels has improved, but they're just not back to what they were before the accident. But they'll get there. Back when I first started my physio with the thrust, I was, everything was a major help to me, so it was. To achieve the goals, I found that my physiotherapist was very good on kept me motivated to, do, to reach my goals every time I'd set them. I was trying to get me to do everything longer and more intensity. Taking part in physio after my time in hospital, it is, I found that it kept me sane as I had nothing really to do with my time at home. No bit of advice I could give to others that's taking part in physio is just keep at it and never give up as it, it will come at a hard but it'll get easier as time goes on. My name is, is Justina McConville and I was knocked down in 2016. Jean and I was coming home from my bra's house. It was just like around the corner from where I live and I can't remember nothing but that there so I and then I remember waking up in the, in the Royal. So it is and that's all I remember so it was. See I don't think it's hard because I'm, I'm the person like the other people around me I feel so sorry for him because I'm forever shouting at her. And, and, but I always say sorry like I wouldn't, I wouldn't I would call her like an asshole or something like that there and then I'd say the next the, the next thing I would say mommy I'm so sorry then I'll go get her a bottle of wine or something and but my bras and all like my twin knows like he he knows now like he knows just time just to walk away walk away but it's bad because like my anger is really bad like I've never I was never really really ang I was angry before when if but not as bad as this here like really bad See, I don't. Saying I'm getting tired. I, when I like, I don't know when I get. Well, I know. I I I was. I'm always tired. I don't know why, but I always, when I'm when I'm tired, I always get angry. So then, and I don't like getting angry. So when I know I'm gonna get bit angry, I know I have light on. So then, so I don't like shouting at people. I hate shouting at people. If you're gonna like like do something bad, go into a room by yourself and just. Think things through and think of all the people that you're going to you're going to hurt. That's the much things that I've actually done, and uh, just like just think, oh my God, I'm going to hurt them. They're going to miss me, or just just like count to ten, or go for a walk, or just whatever works. Like he even said to me, saying just count to ten, just 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 take your time, and everything will be alright, and it has worked. 
my language actually has improved. Like to see after the, the brain injury, my like he even noticed my stutter. I couldn't speak. Like every time I sp like Polly even noticed, like my stutter was really bad, and I didn't even want to speak or nothing. And he gave me a lot of strategies, and now I'm like I I hardly I hardly stutter. So I don't think I'm so happy because I hated my stutter. I was, it annoyed me really badly. I couldn't speak or nothing, and everyone. But everyone knew I had a stutter. It was really, it was, it was alright. But I hate having a stutter. But now I, the the strategies that you you get you get, it helps you. It was really it was annoying because I did I I only got I only started getting fits after a year, after like I my I, I got a wee job and like an off license and my first fit was in was was in the off license, and. No one knew what what had happened, and I lost my wage job and everything, and it annoyed me so it did. And then I I didn't look after. I was like, I'm not looking after myself. I didn't t I didn't take my tablets. I didn't take nothing, and then I, d I just didn't care about myself. And that's when I took I kept taking more fits, and and it was I really it was it was annoying because just because because no one trusts you. No, I just seen you take a fit. No one's gonna want to be with you because they're afraid of they're. But as if you, if as long as you look after yourself and. Just take your tablets, you'll be fine. So yeah, well, there's what I've noticed. The 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 college I done have such care this year in Dean Beauty and I've started a a, a volunteer group in St John's. I passed. I was I was a trainee first aider. Now I'm a first aider. Now I'm a advanced first aider. I passed it last night, and now I'm going to be on an, an emergency transport, which I'm so happy. I'm so happy for, and. I'm just, everything's just getting better, so it is. Everything's just going the right way, so it is. So I'm so happy. Just you just look, I know everything starts bad, but there's, at at, at the end of a, a hang, there's always a rainbow. That's what my sister always says. Says there's always something going to be good out of something bad. That's what I always think. So it is. So now everything's going well, all right, so it is. My name is Oscar, and it was on October sometime in 2016 and we got knocked down and woke up with a head injury and nerve damage in my leg and I'm deaf in my left ear. At the start when I first had my injury I woke up in Musgrave Hospital and I didn't really know what was going on, didn't have a clue. Some people from my family I didn't even know and then I got out. I don't know where it was, but I got out and I heard about Cedar and I got a key worker called Danielle and she came and visited me a couple of times and I would meet her in the library and then we would go over my theory because I really wanted to get my, or my license for driving and we went over and went over and then I got a new Key worker called Fiona. We went to work again, and then I applied for my theory test and I passed the first time. Yeah. So I'm a driver now. I still can't believe it. I can't. It's just mad. I never would have thought possible because I tried it twice before my accident and I failed both times. But the one time I tried after my injury, I passed. I like having the support of. Any of my key workers from Cedar and Bernadette from Eden Day House, I'd like to come and talk to her a couple of times. And yeah, it's just all different now. My memory's not been great after my injury, so people from Cedar have helped me using my phone and set reminders and all that, and that's very helpful. I wish someone had told me to like, never give up. Always get help that you can receive. I would follow the physio advice and definitely get a bit healthier and a bit more stable. Oh yeah, they've been my family's been fine. Well, they say they're fine, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're helpful a lot too, definitely. Well, I would have spoke to them more at the start, like whenever I first found out about it. And a lot, but now I don't really try to bring it up, I just want to be like, known as normal. Well, I feel my recovery is not well, but I still don't know if I'm like myself yet, if you know what I mean.
the person who was before me actually was really like a bad person. They thought it's a good thing or a bad thing. I'll be forever working that out. Well, I would get tired very regularly, but I do cope with it by having naps during the day or something like that, and having an early bedtime. Trying to, anyway. Well, now what I do for fun is go out in the car, obviously, because I'm a driver now. Yeah. And walk my dogs, I like walking my dogs. I bring my dogs up the mountains a couple of times. Well, I remember in Musgrave, my speech was very bad. I had to get help. Did some language service, yeah. I had to get help from one of them, and then when I got out of Musgrave, I would get in contact with Cedar. And there's a man, Paddy, that helped an awful lot, yeah. And he, has a, he had a group called he gave me confidence and it helped an awful lot, yeah, definitely. Just that there's a group there and you're not by yourself. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is trying to try as well. Yeah, you're not the only one that's got a head injury. There's other people out there. Just chat to them and you'll be fine. Hi, my name is Emily and when I was 15 I had hydrocephalus and then when I was 18 I had a cyst in my brain. And whenever uh, I got it removed, then I lost my short-term memory. I managed my fatigue by making sure that I wrote everything down so that I didn't forget because things were constantly going on in my head so I couldn't, like, um, relax. Um, I made sure I didn't use any my phone or watch TV or anything in, like, an hour before bed because it made my brain go mental. Um, just, I just had to just plan everything so that I knew when I was doing things and when to relax and take a bit of time for myself. Uh, the difficulties I have at the moment are remembering to do things because then I live in my own house. Um, it's hard to have to go to work and then come home and try and run a house and then my head just never stops so it's, I find it difficult to sleep. Um, just remembering to do things is probably the hardest thing for me. Writing everything down, writing things uh, down. I write them on my phone mainly because I always have my phone with me. Um, setting alarms, just to remind me to do things. Okay, so I manage my memory problems by writing notes on my phone. And if I have to go to the shop and get anything, I write a list on my phone. Uh, setting reminders on my phone so that the alarm goes off and then I remember to do it. Um, because basically my phone is never in my hand. so. It's just handier for me to have my phone all the time and have reminders set on it. Uh, the most difficult thing for me when it first happened was people not understanding and people just treating me like I was normal because they look normal. And I find that very hard because I couldn't keep up and I couldn't remember things and it frustrated me and it frustrated them. Um, but I probably tell myself now to just, like it's not the end of the world, just write things down and get on with it. Basically, understanding my brain injury helped me because I thought I didn't need to write things down. I thought I could do it and I would remember. And a lot of times I did remember, but I had things in my head all the time. So with Kira advising me to write things down on my phone, it my mind was clear then because I knew I had it wrote down and I knew I was going to remember. So that's what helped me and it helped me with my sleep and everything because my head was just all over the place. I could definitely get less frustrated by myself because it was not that no one had to remember something but I couldn't remember what it was and it just used to drive me mad but now that I have a reminder and I remember what it is and and you sort of feel I feel like relief whenever I know that I've all the things that I wanted to remember done um, and then I feel relaxed and a lot better. Um, the advice that I would give would be to not be hard on them because that's the worst thing you can do, because then it makes them more mad at themselves. Uh, try to understand as best as you can, but don't do everything for them, because I have to do things myself or else I, I would be useless. So it's, it's what got me better, I think, was doing things myself. Um, so definitely be there for them, listen, try and advise them to write things down, like my parents did with me as well, um, and just just don't be hard on them because that's it's not going to get them better. My advice would be to just relax and go easy on yourself because it's not the end of the world and I thought it was and I could not cope at all but care helped me loads and 
now I am doing really well and it's not the end of the world at all. I'm getting on with life. It's great. Yeah, my name is Mark Graham. Um, basically what happened to me was I took a, a cloud cyst on my brain. I didn't know it was happening until um, I was rushed to the hospital, taken into the hospital and realised that um, there was something wrong. I had spent the whole week thinking I had a, a very bad cold, just a lot of fuzziness and haziness in my head and things like that there. To not be able to drive, coming from the, the job I was doing, which was driving basically 10 hours a day, and to not be able to drive um, was pretty tough because you felt sort of isolated and you couldn't do things that you, you could, your independence was gone. So you had to um, rely on other people to take you places and to go places, or if you were doing anything, you had to go, you had to walk to these places. So it became, it became difficult, not um, as time went on, it became difficult, but in the early years, it was being ferried about, so um, I was unaware of, of basically that I wasn't driving as such because it, it was so early, so early on in my um, illness. But then, as time progressed, and I wanted to become, I became more independent myself, not dependent on others. Then the driving became a problem to me, and I was dependent on other people just to help me out. Um, I lost my my license was gone for a year, I think, which wasn't too bad, I suppose, because. Most of that time I spent was rehabilitation after what happened to me. So, um, but still dependent, coming close to the end of, of the rehabilitation, it became a struggle then because you had to sort of depend on others. I wasn't used to depending on other people. And um, you had to, your, your independence was gone, but you had to depend on other people as such, which wasn't me, it was, I was more a, a, a my own person to do my own thing. And that's it's sort of why it, how it affected me as such. Uh, you just felt you felt very vulnerable um, emotionally. You would be sort of trying to deal with the, the struggle of recovering from brain injury, and then emotionally you were you were sort of content trying to contend yourself with the fact that okay I can't do these things now. I'm just going to have to bear it out and be patient and work work with the team and basically just take your time and it will come back to you. But my goal was basically, I, was kept, I kept myself positive the whole time in the fact that I had an end goal. My end goal was basically to get back to where I was and that was what kept me going. And I just kept walking and keeping exercising and just keeping myself active as, such, as much as possible to keep me focused on what my end goal was. My end goal basically still is to get back to um, my full-time employment and the job I was doing beforehand, which was a sales rep on the road, and that's constantly driving all the time. Yeah, there were there were financial implications in the fact that we were it was it was definitely but my my company who I worked for were very, very good in the fact that they supported me financially right through the whole um right through near the end. Um the scheme of sick pay I was on meant that I was getting my pay right up until a certain point. To, well, just before and back after Christmas. But then after Christmas when I took a relapse and then went off again, it became a bit of a struggle financially. We, we, were, we were finding it pretty tight and we're all we were just depending on my wife's wage. And that was really it. Yes, it would be, there would be impact on the family and the younger people in the family, my younger son, basically for football and things like that there. Um, because I was used to taking him to football. I was the coach of the football team at that stage and was able to take him to these places. And then all of a sudden, I can't take him to these places. And there were certain times where there was no left available, where I'd have to actually walk him to the um, to his training and things like that there, just to, to ensure that he got his, um, still that he got his training and got got doing his exercises, or his, his activities and things like that. Really well, we live um, pretty much out of the main main town of Nuri, and we're a fair bit away from Kamla as well, which is another wee village, which is quite active. Um, so where we are is not in the countryside but we're within, it's walking distance to most places that you go to um, to get anywhere. So you had to walk a couple of miles to get places as well. So there was no driving assessment to go back to um, to driving. It was just a case of a doctor's report. Um, my GP, stock, GP doctor um, had to sign off a form to say that he was happy that I was quite willing, or quite able to go back to work, or back to um, driving, sorry. And that was the assessment, basically. It was just basically 
me fizzing him, him assessing me as in, you know, are you okay, how are you feeling, basically you no know, short questions, nothing major, um, and that was just basically all I had to do to go back. There was nothing intricate about getting back in the driving, just about getting into, you know, just your doctor signed it off, if he was happy that you're, you're ready to go back to driving. On returning to work, myself and Diane, the occupational therapist, worked on how I would tackle um, the day-to-day -day activities within work. And one of the one of the things we came up with was, um, which was very helpful, was keeping a diary of activities. Any questions are asked you, note them down. To ask people if they want something done, to email you with the with the um, the questions, so that you you had a list of activities to work your way through, um, which was very helpful in the early days. Now it's as time goes on, I feel as if my memory has improved, to the fact where. My job entails writing stuff in the book anyway, so you're always writing orders down. At the minute I'm, in, I'm back into sales, in the internal sales, so you're taking note of customers' names and what their orders are, or what their inquiry is, so you have something, a list of activities to work through. But very, very important to note things in a, in a book and write them down because it's something good to, to reflect upon then. Together, I mean, with attract or with taking an, an injury, a brain injury, um, it's a journey not just for an individual, the person it happens to, it's a family journey and basically what you have is everyone has to sort of come together and understand what you're going through. You have to communicate with one another, tell each other how you're feeling. Um, my wife was a great support to me in the fact that she always prompted me how I was feeling, you know, how I was getting on. She would test my memory and things like that there, which was very, very important in the early... To me, it felt that it wasn't the thing to do, but in reflection, it was definitely the thing to do. I thought, no, it's not that she, that she was patronising me in any shape or form, but she was just trying to get me to sort of dig deeper in, into my memory, and I would be asking questions about, you know, how... trying to remember things, and she'd, she'd prompt me... Rather than tell me the answer, she'd prompt me and asked me to try and dig deeper into my own memory, which sort of, at the time, was, was a struggle. Um, but it was a case of, you know, just you had to work at it. And that's just what I did. Just, I had to, just had to, my focus was just basically to work at getting better, getting myself back on track again. And um, in the early days, it was really, really hard in the fact that you were, you couldn't remember what you did five minutes ago. And you're constantly asking questions about, no, did I, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I? You were sort of, you're always doubting if you did something or if didn't, if you didn't do something. It was just basically, you had to be asking people all the time, or asking your children, no, am I such, am I doing this? Did I do that? Did I? You just, you couldn't remember things. You just couldn't remember if you'd done it, and you knew there was something there that you had to do, but you just had to rely on other people. As a family, we just sort of worked together on it, which worked very well for me in the early days. In the early days, or if, with getting a brain injury, the best advice I would give is work with the team that you're, that's looking after you. They're there to do a job, to do it. It might seem silly what's, what's being asked of you and to do, but just work with it because that's very important that you um, work with the team and they're getting you to a certain goal. They have the experience to get you to a certain stage in, in your recovery and working with them will speed up the recovery. Just work with them. Don't, don't work against them. Work with them all the time. I, I would say, the only other thing I would, t I would talk about is be patient and remember and know that you're going to get to the end. The end goal is rec full recovery and know you're going to get there. Just be patient and work with it because if you want things to happen so too quickly, it'll not happen quickly. Just let it happen as it happens, because your brain is a wonderful tool that will develop as you develop with it. Hi, my name's Lisa Campbell. Um, my mum has an acquired brain injury, and she sustained this following um, brain surgery in September 2015. Um, it was out of the blue. We had about two weeks to prepare ourselves for surgery as a family and um, I am delighted to give you as much information as I can on this. So um, 
I'm going to begin with how a family member can help in this situation. So as a family member, I know my mum, I know her normal routine, I know her expectations and her needs. So I suppose those were my goals. I wanted to achieve normality as quickly as possible following surgery. So in order to do that, I had to prepare the family, prepare the home, and also prepare the younger kids in the house, which were, that was the hardest bit I think for me was getting the kids to adapt. So um, I think some of the important things to remember are the goals. I mean, there are no timelines with this. Don't seek a timeline. You can ask how long is it going to take, but don't expect a straight answer because everyone's different, everyone's an individual. So you're going to have to just take time with it and see the timelines and see the, see the goals that you can achieve. Um, uh, recognizing those goals, you're going to have to edit this bit clearly. <laughs> so see, see I think um, what I've written um, is, you know, when you're, I suppose whenever you're looking for, you're asking about a timeline and how long it's going to be to the person that you love becomes normalized again. Well, let's just say that, that that's, those are the milestones that you're going to cover um, become your goals. And when you, when you achieve those milestones, those should be celebrated each time. But with regards to the ripple effect that you will have within the family circle, um, as I've said before, the kids will adjust at different rates. The younger kids seem to adjust much faster than the teenagers. Um, and I think it's very important that you prepare children in particular because they, um, they don't know what to expect. And let's face it, neither do we. Um, but we're old enough and wise enough to ask the questions and to seek the knowledge that we need and get the research done. Um, but the kids rely on us to direct them. And I think it's important that we teach them first and foremost to slow down their speech, to listen carefully with intent and not to react. And that they have to adapt and they have to listen to the person with the brain injury. And they won't be the same, but it's still that same person. They're just a little bit different. Um, and take your time with them, take time. Um, and the changes won't be absorbed overnight with kids. Uh, it can be six months down the line. You might see the changes after a year. And what I have noticed with my own child, my youngest boy, is fantastic because in the mornings, the first thing he'll do is he'll skip into mum's house and he'll say, hi nanny, how are you today? And he'll take her dog out for a walk. Um, do you need anything in the shop? And it's crazy, they, they take on board what needs to be done and let them help you know let them work with you they're part of the recovery too the information that i received about brain injury that was most helpful to me was to remember that every case is individual there's a lot of information out there through all the different medias and social media there's a lot of books that you can read um, but the most important thing is that you have to look at the case that you are dealing with. Yes, read. Yes, research. But think about the person behind it because you know that individual. And it's about adapting and applying the information that you have discovered yourself to that individual case. Okay, the advice that I would give myself from the start is get organised. The most important thing and the most important tools that we used in the rehabilitation of my mum were the acute brain injury team as a resource and also a few little things like um, an F4 diary, page, page a day diary which became a journal to us and a journal also for, for my mum to reflect upon what had happened in previous days, um, what was the weather like for example, simple things, what did we eat for tea? Um, did we have any visitors? Did, did we go for a walk? Um, simple things that can trigger a memory from the day or the week previous. And also it's a great way to keep a record. You know, did something happen? Did, did, some, did, did she, my mum react to something in particular? Um, how's she feeling? 
Um, has there been a change in medication? Has she got an appointment? Um, everything. Keep a diary. It's vital to your knowledge, um, to, your, to the history of what has happened to your family member. Um, and also, the other thing that we would have used a lot was, an a we had an A4 um, whiteboard and marker that we took everywhere with us. Um, my mum had frequent visits to different hospitals and staying up to maybe eight weeks at a time. Um, and re reorientation was a, was a big issue for my mum. Um, so I suppose that we used the whiteboard for the day, the date, where she was, was vitally important. Um, and also contact numbers on that board. And she would use her mobile to phone those numbers if she wasn't sure where she was, why she was there. Um, and again, it's about keeping that link and, and also about giving the confidence to my mum that she had control and she was able to do that. Okay, what I would tell a new carer. First of all, yeah, get prepared, get organised. There's no time scale on this. Be flexible. Um, make sure you have the support around you. Look at your, your own family, first of all. Look at your partner, look at your, 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 your kids. And then look to your brothers, sisters, look to your mum's friends, your father's friends, whoever the person with the brain injury, look to um, neighbours. Everyone wants to help. It's vitally, vitally important that you have the support network around you in order for you to be able to support this person that needs you. You are their support. You, you must be able to look after yourself and part of that is seeking help from others. How I balance caring for my mum and caring for myself. We, we have a lot of hobbies that cross over and I think one of the most important things that we did at the beginning was to get active pretty fast. Mum loved to walk her dog um, and we did that almost every day when we could um, and we took the dog for a walk. Um, it's fantastic for I think re orientation, number one, and also number two, the social aspect of it, because the last thing you want is to be the only face that this person sees every day. Take them out, meet new people. Um, Mum was very, very, very keen at learning languages, so we frequently attend a language class as well now, which has been amazing. And again, it extends Mum's social um, outlook as well. Um, one of the other things that we used was I have retrained from my previous career as a yoga instructor now and I have taken my mum to a lot of my classes and she's been fantastic, um, you know, working with the beginners and, and helping me with um, alignment of all things. Um, and also um, working with a, a stroke group as well, which has been amazing. So we, I do chair yoga as well and mum really enjoys it. So where my career has had to change and evolve my mum is still part of that and we enjoy doing that together well the use of things for her was coming over here you know it was hard when she went through what she went through it was terrible we didn't think she was going to live because we heard that many different things but in the end we got there right and then we got to have to come here to the entire house which i never heard tell of in my life because it was never a bin and board out and didn't know what it was helped her an awful lot and patty was brilliant with her too with her speech and we different things have gone and have to as you deep breathing you said keep deep breathing to get yourself in a bad temper and it made her look for something that she needed because we were never through a brain in our life never and now was she but we got we did get there we had to brought her over for six weeks for a course for something for speech called for something else for something for me are you coming over like you know i'm not going i'm not doing this i'm not doing that but thank god you said it happened and that was the main thing and I remember being over here one day and she chastised me two or three times when you were here and Dr. McGuire. You know, and not that I was saying, she said, you're telling lies, that's not right. <laughs> you know, but you have to take that because I haven't went through what she went through and nobody will ever know what she went through until you see that, thank God she came through it. There is people worse off than her. But she's getting there, Brenda, in steps, you know, but sure. 
at Boyd Bovers fantastic. I never tell if it was a party I'd give it to me. And he said, because I was saying about, I, he, he gave me a wee burger with a pint and so on, but she kept saying to me, no, it's not that day, it's the next day. And I happened to say to Paddy one day, and then he I give you this. And I got the whiteboard, or I, think, I don't know why I was Paddy, maybe it was somebody else. And I put up in my fridge, and I put down every day she had to come, and she knew then when she had to come to get them. Brilliant. You know, we things like that, we bits and pieces that help you through. And different exercises, you give her different exercises, like breathing in and breathing out, or she got frustrated, you know, or if she's tired, go to bed. Which I was telling her, but wouldn't take me under. I noticed that she come here and she actually took the truth out. Very hard. What kind of thing? Very, very hard. Very hard because uh, you get uh, very bad tempered. And we curse a lot, which she never cursed in her life. And then after she, she's laughing, because she knows she done it, uh, would have fought with me in the house, didn't want this, didn't want that, didn't want the other. And then I think she found out in the end when she started to come down to her house and started to realise what she had. I don't think Justine herself realised that she was bad. As she was, she didn't know how bad it was till she came over here and found out and when they started to tell her and help her a bits and pieces. I think that's when she realised she was cross and like a devil, you couldn't live with her. And no matter what I tried to tell the doctor, she chastised me and said I was telling lies, what she said today. But she got there in the end. She had to. And thank God she had good support and she had good family behind her and helped her in every way. Well, at the start, they didn't understand very that, to be quite honest with you. They did not, didn't know what her attitude was. They thought maybe she was just bad tempered. Oh, that's all she did. But they didn't understand. But then, with me coming with her and I explained to her what she was going through, that she was going to be like that for the next four or five years because it was the brain injury that she got was very serious. But she got it all in her front. And yes, yeah, she does forget things. And she says things. And she does things. But they all now understand her too. And they help her in every way. If she wants to go out, they'll bring her. She takes notions, I don't want her to go, but she's way out like the dickens through the front door. And I worry about it because I'm afraid of her because she was taking after like the bits in the bay that. And I was always afraid of taking one when she was out. So no matter where she goes, she takes somebody with her. She's never on her own, Brenda. And from she goes out to like and back, I worry the whole time. And somebody's going at my door, she's fell or she's hit her head again or she's somebody's fighting out, to say, I suppose she goes to him, maybe to a game. Maybe fight starting and somebody maybe hitting the horn head, that's what back in the hospital. I keep myself busy. At the start I didn't, for it lost an awful lot of weight after she had cut the, uh, uh, what do you call it, after she had the accident. Lost an awful lot of weight, with worry, wasn't eating. But as she got stronger, I got stronger. And even thing going down there oil for the four months was terrible. Oh my God, burned that, even going in there and saying to her land and all tubes, you know, is she going to come through, is she not going to come through one day? Or, our, our price was up, the next day our price was low, they were doing this, we're doing that and the other. But every day, thank God, got stronger and stronger. And then we found out that we were moving her up to the ward, which was over the moon, we were all delighted. She was on the phone, moved up to the ward, up, up in the Royal, and it was great. Then had to get a bit tracked again because she took an away infection in her chest. And that was terrible, she was pulling it out two or three times, pulling it out of her nose. They end up had to tire burned it in the bed and put boxing gloves on her to keep her hands out of the road. And then as she got stronger then she seen Mr. Uh, McCann out of, uh, oh, I can't remember, Mus the regional, uh, yeah. yeah. And she could, uh, now she couldn't talk about that, but she got a book, which we bought book and pencils and she'd read everything down and told us about wearing the blue short and the dicky bow with the spats on, which when he came in through the door we knew him right away. And she went there for three and a half weeks and loved it and we're awful good to her. I wish her me was to get home for Halloween and go to her formal, which she did. And we brought her up to the formal and we went and brought her home. But again, she argued, didn't want to go home. She thought she was 16, do what I want, dance and all. But she hadn't got the strength. But we got there. Had to, no more choice. But more positive in the own way and not to let yourself down in front of her. Because if you're down, she's looking at you and saying, there's nothing wrong here, am I going, maybe that's just the way I felt. Because when I would have went down to the Royal, I always kept myself right, would have brought a wee book, and maybe sat in the bed and read and talked to her, to keep myself occupied. And she would have blinked her wee eyes every now and then, so well, and she, she knew that I was there, so think positive all the time. The face I would give them to be very strong, very positive. Try and look their best, even they don't want to be their best, to try to go down and look at the child and help her talk to her. Bring a book, even she's only sit and read, to 
keep yourself busy because if you don't, you'll get up and you'll run away somewhere because you have to keep going and going and going. That's all I can say. My name's Carmel O'Callaghan um, from Arma. Um, in 2001, my husband went off to work as normal um, and he didn't arrive home. And then I got a phone call to say that he was in the hospital. He had got his, his head had been crushed um, by a big iron bar um, and he had to go through an operation. Um, and he was in hospital for so long and had rehabilitation and then he came home um, and then I had to look after him. Okay. I had to give up my work for, for well, I, I went on, um, they let me off for two weeks um, at work um, to care for him and um, because I work in sort of the care and profession, I thought, oh, I can handle this okay. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it just wasn't, at the beginning he was very sick and he couldn't do anything for himself and I would have had to help him go to the toilet and you know do all his personal care and whatever and that was okay but as he was getting better then it started um he changed um and things he would have done he couldn't do mm -hmm. or he didn't want to do them or he would be quite abrupt with us mm -hmm. you know everybody was yeah the way we approached him would be, um, it was totally different. We couldn't talk to him the way we would have done. And when we did do, because we, it was all new to us, he would have um, been quite sharp with us. And, and then the next thing he would sit and cry and you'd feel, you know. But all along I thought he would, um, oh, he's just not well, he will get better, you know. Um, and the children had to be careful about the noise in the house and the way they approached him. You know, he could be quite sharp with them and things like that that they never understood because their daddy was such a quiet, caring, you know, mm -hmm. person. And it did, it, it had a, a terrible effect on us, yeah. It got that the, um, the children would have, um, there were two of them, Kevin was 16 and Michael was eight and um, I noticed that they would have um, stayed away from John nearly, you know, or tiptoed, you were walking on eggshells. And I would have um, said to the children, shh, daddy's not good today or whatever, you know. Um, yet I, I wanted to keep, protect them yeah. as well. You know, it was so difficult. Um, yeah, the children, we were lucky we had a, a big enough house that the children sort of stayed in one room and that's the way it was. And John stayed in another and they'd say to me, what form's daddy in? Mm -hmm. And I would say he's in good form today. Mm -hmm. And then they'd go in and sit and talk to him and then, you know, this is the way it was. It just was not, well, in, in, um, yeah, the challenging behaviours. Initially, I think I got it all wrong. I, um, if John said something, and I would sort of question him, and I would have said, but John, why would you say that? Um, and that went on for years, because I didn't have any support from anywhere. When we lived in England, there was only John and myself and the two boys. Family all lived in Ireland, and my family lived a hundred miles away in England. So there was just us, and we muddled through it. Um, and everything John said to me, I took to heart, and that caused I questioned everything. And then it was when I, um, we came back to Ireland and the GP got in contact with the GP and he, um, he was good, but I mean, you know, he doesn't know, he didn't know, people, people don't really know. Mm -hmm. um, and then we got in contact with this um, brain injury um, team and that was when my life changed. From coming here, I have learned not to be so hard on myself um, and to, um, you know, try and let what John says wash over you. Don't take it personally, which I did do all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and um, if a situ how to walk away from a situation instead of questioning it and saying, well, why did you say that? I've got now and I actually notice 
an awful difference. You know, to, to not to encourage the situation, but to, John being a lot, um, John's a lot quiet, quieter, not this anger. He still has, John's very angry about his accident. And he's still talking after all these years about getting back to the person he was, which we know that he won't. Um, um, but when he gets angry in that, you know, I just put my hand up and say, OK, John, and I walk out, where before I would have said, mm -hmm. and then, of course, it escalated. If somebody was starting out like this, I would say, go and see the brain injury team. Go and see anybody, headway. In England, we had headway, and they were very, very good um, at the beginning. But then as time went on and John decided to go back to work and he tried to go to work and he couldn't go to work and, you know, all this type of thing. And then they sort of fade away, which is okay. Um, but you need support. You need people telling you it's okay. You know, you're okay because there's so many times that I wanted to walk out and say, I can't do this anymore. And then I would come to Louise and... No, I wouldn't have done that. What I... Looking back, I should have done a lot of research, which I didn't. I thought, I thought John's head injury was like him having his appendix out. And mm -hmm. um, once he, he um, you know, got back up onto his feet, he'd be back to normal again. I didn't realise that, that 18 years later, yeah, 18 years later, that John still sits at night feeling his stitches and then telling me that, you know, somebody had their fingers in my brain. And I'm, you know, thinking to myself, I really don't want to hear this because I know it. I've heard it so many times, but I would sit and listen to him and, you know, I, um, I would, wouldn't, you know, you, I think I needed to do, I should have done my research. But because you're so involved in looking after them, looking after children as well and protecting them, which I did, was another thing I feel I should have been more open with them and said, this is the way Daddy is. Yeah, most definitely. Like, Kevin, the older boy, 16, he suffered quite with anxiety and um, he had to get counselling. And I would um, tell them to reach out for help um, and make people understand what is going on with the, with the, um, the person who's had the brain injury. Mm -hmm. um, people, we, I found that, that it, especially when we moved back to Ireland where we were among family, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking, Thank goodness now we've got our family around us. And they would all come in, and if John didn't speak to them, they'd go home in a huff. In, and, you know, you have to inform them and sit them down and say to them, this is not, you know, and even the grandchildren, you have to say to them, go in and say hello to Granddad. You know, and because some days he would say hello to them and the next day he wouldn't. You know, but um, but reach out for help. Okay. You have to have support. You can't do it on your own. I thought I could, but you can't. Now, at, at the beginning, I would have um, had no support because I felt I could have done it all on my own. He was my husband. He was the person I loved, and I'm, I'm the one that could have made him better. No, you can't do that. Um, now, I would um, call on people to come in. If I want to go somewhere, I would, you know, say, um, my granddaughter now today is, stayed last night, she's 16, she, and she loves him and knows his ways and all, and she stayed with him today um, because I was coming here. Um, and if I want to go anywhere, um, somebody would pop in, and they all do. They're very good at that now, and we had a discussion um, Louise came to the house and spoke to us um, and some of the children and they've actually understood now. But be honest with your children and tell them, don't, don't hide anything from them because I did do that and it was so wrong, you know, for them. Well, it's difficult because you could plan to go somewhere someday and if they're not well. And you are the only per. I found that John, I was the only person that John would trust. Um, so, um, I would have had to have cancelled out, um, but people were very good. 
Um, it was like meeting up with friends and going for coffee and things like that. I would have ran and said, look, not suitable today. John's not well, we'll do it another day. But now the children, I, I've sort of got now that I can break that tie away. And if he's not too well, I'd say to the children, call in and see Dad. You know, go in and see him and, you know, sit and chat and whatever. And if he wants to talk, he'll talk. And if he doesn't, then you can say, I've only popped in for two minutes. So that's good. Um, I'm quite a uh, uh, easy person, I think. I'm quite, I'm quite a home bird. I like being at home because we have got a large family and the children come in, the grandchildren all come in and I take real hot. I love them coming in. Um, and now we've got a little great-grandson great and he comes in too. So that's really, you know, to me a big thing. Um, and I go and get my hair done every Wednesday and I have a little group of friends up in the hairdressers and we all meet on a Wednesday morning and we have a cup of coffee in the hairdressers and they all think we're, we're hilarious because we all have a, a little chat and a meet up at a little meeting place um, on a Wednesday and then I, I, um, I don't really go away. I'm not one for going away for weekends and things. I, I, I'm okay at home mm -hmm. um, and I go down and, and look after my brother-in-law who has a, um, a disability, John's brother. He, um, and I, he's um, in a wheelchair and he's got brain damage and that, uh, completely different to John's, but um, he's in a home, a little small home, and I get, I get great enjoyment going down to sit with him and have the coffee there too, and the staff, the, you know, we're all one big friend, and I, that's, I enjoy that. Okay. Um, and, yeah, I, I, I find plenty to do, you know, or... On the other occasion, I took myself into the car and drove to Dollyball on my own and told nobody. Understanding, yeah. I've, I've great um, understanding for people now. You know, I've nearly, um, if I thought somebody, you know, needed any help, I would be there for them. Not, you know, not practically, but to, to be there to listen. And I do say to people, you know, even with anything, it doesn't need to be just brain damage, any illness at all, everybody needs somebody to, to support, lean on. Mm -hmm. well, nearly everything really, because I think I got it all wrong. Uh, the, you know, um, the thing about the, the, he has no filter, that was a big thing for me. Because when John would come out and say these things to me, I really took them all very personally. Mm -hmm. And I really believed that he did, he did not like me. And I was this and my family that live in England and mind their own business. He used to say horrible things about them. Um, and I, you know, but now I don't. I just sort of, okay, yeah, maybe you're right. Sometimes I just agree with him. And I, I've learned that. And I've learned that you don't, you don't always have to be especially honest with them. You can sort of tweak something. If you were going somewhere, if you were going somewhere... You know, you don't... I would have been a great one for saying yeah. something, you know... Um, for instance, my mum would come over to visit my sister and I would say, now they're coming over in two weeks' time um, and they're only staying two days and he would go on and on about it because it disrupted his routine. Mm -hmm. And um, I've learnt now, no, you don't say anything. You say, wait till the day before and you say, oh, I got a phone call today. You never guess, mummy's popping over. And I felt, you know, these little things, they're not dishonest, but they're just to help me and help him too. From the start, I would have said, come, you know, go and get help. You can't do this on your own. Nobody can do it on their own because it's the unknown. And it's really frightening. You know, this person that was full of life and on a Saturday night we used to go out just for a drink, and John would end up singing. You know, he was that type, and we had loads of friends, um, and that used to be the highlight of our night, um, and get up and have a little jive, you know, and that was it. Um, now, to not go anywhere, doesn't want to associate with anybody, doesn't even want people in the house. Um, if people come to visit, uh, John sit for 20 minutes and go up to bed, and I'm left sitting and entertaining, this type of thing, you know, but... It's okay, you know, um, and we've, we've lost a lot of our friends over it. Um, 
you know, he's, he's changed so much, but still, underneath, he's still the person. And the only good thing is that because he was a good person, he still is a good person, but he was very, um, you know, he, he um, didn't have all these hang-ups he's got now. We remember all that. Mm -hmm. So you can still relate back to that. And the older children um, would say, do you remember when Dad did this or whenever, you know... It's, it's, you know, and we talk about it and we say how sad it is and then I say yes but this is it now we have to get on with it and we have to find ways of dealing with it and we're getting to that point I think yeah